Welcome to Pepin, birthplace of Laura Ingalls Wilder. So we're at the Laura Ingalls Wilder Museum and Gift Shop, and there she is. And her books each represent a location. This is Little House in the Big Woods is Pepin. Her story begins here. Hmm. The fox fur hat is made from fine fibers and the dense underfur of the fox, making it lightweight yet warm, leaving the tail on the hat is simply a design element to identify the source of the fur. And hand muffs were a fashion accessory for outdoors to keep the hands warm. Well, that's a really large kettle. Agriculture was still a process undertaken mostly by hand and with the power of horses and oxen at the time of Laura's birth in 1867. Farms in developing areas like Pepin tended to be small and provided food primarily for the family that lived on a site. In a good season, a farm might also produce a little extra to sell or trade for goods. No uh, goods one could not grow or make oneself. Artifacts in this collection were used by early residents of our community to plant and harvest crops and tend to livestock. And throughout this museum, they have little quotes from the book, pages from the book, um, Little House in the Big Woods. Pa and Uncle Henry were out in the field cutting oats and cradles. A cradle was a sharp steel blade fastened to a framework of wooden slats. That's this. Every evening before he began to tell stories, Paul made the bullets for his next day's hunting. Laura and Mary, Mary helped him. They brought the big, long-handled spoon and the box full of bits of lead and the bullet mold. Then while he squatted on the hearth and made the bullets, they sat one on each side of him and watched. tools and here's a wall of family members it's Charles and Caroline there's Laura's Christmas penny this was donated to the museum in 1985. It is the quilt of Laura Ingalls Wilder, her actual quilt. When the fiddle stopped singing, Laura called out softly, what are days of old Lang Syne, Pa? They are the days of a long time ago, Laura, Pa said, go to sleep now. But Laura lay awake while listening to Pa's fiddle softly playing and to the lonely sounds of the wind in the big woods. She looked at Pa sitting on the bench by the hearth, the firelight gleaming on his brown hair and beard and glistening on the honey brown fiddle. She looked at Ma gently rocking and knitting. She thought to herself, this is now. She was glad that the cozy house and Pa and Ma and the firelight and the music were now. They could not be forgotten, she thought, because now is now. They can never be a long time ago. This is what a typical organ would have looked like in Laura's time. It's protected right now from my fingers. Very smart, because I'm always tempted to touch. And this table here belonged to Anna Berry, Laura Ingalls first teacher. Hmm. That must be a picture of her. One of the smaller kids had to sit on the front bench. Then they had a little desk to do their work. Miss Anne, 
Anna Berry, Laura's first teacher. Okay, this is a nice printout of Laura's travels. So we start with Birth in Pepin. And the book that goes with that is Little House in the Big Woods. Then she goes to Sheridan County, Missouri, Independent, Kansas, and that would be the Little House on the Prairie. Then Walnut Grove, we'll take you there soon. And on the banks of Plum Creek. Then Burr Oak, Iowa. And then Desmet, South Dakota, which is where we took you. And these are the books that went along with those. That location, five books. And then Spring Valley, Minnesota, you see Laura's parents, Paul and Ma stayed here in Desmet, and that's where they passed on. But Laura and Almanzo moved on to Spring Valley, Minnesota. Westville, Florida, <laughs> I'll take you there one day. And Mansfield, Missouri, where Laura died in 1957. Almanzo died in 1949. Oh, that's neat. We're stepping into the kitchen of the museum to show you what it would be like. And these are the different methods of food preservation. They dehydrated food, sugar and honey. They would smoke their food, they would seal it with fat. I particularly like that fat sealing one where they would store the food at the bottom of the pot and then they would cover it with meat fat, lard, and uh, it would harden and pr like make a cap on top. And then we've got pickling, salting, and cellaring. You know, we don't have cellaring in Florida because we don't have anything cold enough. But they were uh, full of food at times. Kitchen utensils. A dry sink is a piece of furniture common in homes before the invention of indoor plumbing. Styles vary, but generally a dry sink consisted of a cabinet with a slightly recessed top made to hold a basin and pitcher for water. And the cabinet was a convenient place to keep the supplies out of sight. And the wood for the stove, because that is a wood-burning stove. Aunt Eliza had brought Ma a large red apple stuck full of clothes. Oh, how good it smelled, and it would not spoil f for so many clothes would keep it sound and sweet. After she had put the cream in the tall crockery churn and set it near the stove to warm, she washed and scraped the long orange-colored carrot. Then she grated it on the bottom of the old leaky tin pan that Pa had punched full of nail holes for her. Ma rubbed the carrot across the roughness until she had rubbed it all through the holes. And when she lifted it up the pan, there was a soft, juicy mound of grated carrot. There's an example of some of the pioneer quilts and clothing. A lovely jacket with the fur around the neck and a shoe button machine manufactured by the Elliott Button and Fastener Company. The machine was used to insert buttons into antique leather shoes, such as those. And there's some of the sunbonnets and hats and the sweet little dresses for little girls, I guess little boys too. <laughs> I wonder if that's a wedding dress. It looks like it. In Farmer Boy, a book, Laura describes a traditional home textile production that was led by Almanzo's mother, the Wilder family farm in Malone, New York. Laura's writing about sheep shearing and weaving describes ways of making clothes that had changed for a little changed little for centuries. During the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century, people largely stopped making cloth, cloth at home as the development of large industrial mills for spinning yarn and weaving cloth made textiles more affordable and widely available. The artifacts in our collection are representation of this period of immigrant 
textile production in the later decades of the 19th century. And for bonus, we get two museums out of one. This museum is all about Pepin, which is where we're at. They've got the furs that were trapped in those times when Laura was a child. And I guess even growing older, Pa would uh, trap the furs with these kinds of traps and sell the fur. Fur trading here in this area was huge. Different kinds of stones used as tools or weapons. <laughs> And we know an old wagon, a prairie schooner, built for pioneer travel. Pa would sit on the front, maybe Ma with him, and the kids in the back. And the dog would follow underneath. What else do we have here? So here in Pepin, the pearl button industry started. They made them out of shells. Look at all these buttons. All just out of those shells. Isn't that crazy? Huh. Moonlight excursion. Excursion. So this is uh, what it would be like to get on the Columbia. Stern wheel packet excursion. <laughs> it's an old champion sewing machine. Cash register. Ooh. An old phone. Books, the original books, Laura's autographing party, quilt and doily that belonged to Rose Wilder Lane, donated by Roger McBride, executor and soul of heir of Miss Lane. Now Rose is Laura Engels's daughter, Laura and Almanzo's daughter. These are authentic letters written by Laura Ingalls. Dear Nade, thank you for your nice letter written on such pretty note paper. It seems strange that you pick up stones on the shore of Lake Pepin, where I played so long ago when I was a little girl. The stones are so pretty and it is such fun to pick them up. With love, your friend, Laura Ingalls Wilder, written from Mansfield, Missouri on April 20th, 1950. That was sweet. To his first radio. Oh, first radio on Pepin. <laughs> what stations do you get? Wow. That's ancient. Huh. Uh. Some more family. Check out the fire extinguisher. It was like a glass bowl of water from the 1870s through the early 1900s. When a small fire broke out in the interior of a home, a glass orb known as a fire grenade was thrown at the base of the flames. The grenades were filled with either salt water or carbon tetrachloride and sealed with a cork and cement. When the glass orb shattered on contact with the contents spewed onto the flames, the chemical vaporized into fire extinguishing gas. Huh. Once upon a time, a little girl lived in the big woods of Wisconsin in a little gray house made of logs. Writing about herself and her life here, Laura Ingalls Wilder thus began Little House in the Big Woods, the first of her famous Little House books. Laura was born here on February 7, 1867, late in 1868 or in the spring of 1869. 
The Ingalls family left Wisconsin and traveled by covered wagon to Kansas. They found Kansas to be Indian country, so shortly after Carrie was born in August of 1870, Charles Ingalls brought his family back to the little house near Pepin. In 1871, Mary and Laura enrolled in the Berry Corner School near here. They sold this farm in 1873 and moved to Minnesota. Laura Ingalls Wilder is loved both for her delightful writing style and for her good homespun philosophy reflecting on her rugged frontier youth. The Laura Ingalls Wilder Memorial Society, Inc. of Pepin, Wisconsin, organized in 1974, is proud to provide you Little House Wayside as a memorial to this great lady and beloved author. This house here is a replica of the house she was born in. Um, and she said, like I said, born February 7th, 1867. This house was erected in 1978. Looks like it's in good shape. The last thing to do is to dig a well. Does this one work? Oh, there's no handle. Oh, it's got a button. Well, that's not fun. I liked the kind that you had to pump. All right, so we can go inside the wayside cabin where Laura Ingalls Wilder was born. Ooh, it's kind of chilly in here. Surprising. This was the pantry. Everything nicely labeled. I feel like the boogeyman's going to jump out at me. Nothing but some wood. But the room feels cold itself, and this is the bedroom where all five slept. Ma, Pa, Mary, Carrie, and Laura. Wow. Wonder how cozy that was. There's the fireplace. I imagine that's where we cook and everything because there is no kitchen in here, as we can see. So everything had to have been cooked and heated from this location. And what do we got here? An informational wall. A wall full of information. All right, that's it. Bye bye, Laura Ingalls Wilder's cabin where you were born. All right, so that was Pepin for y'all. Showed you the museum and where Laura Ingalls Wilder was born. We got some souvenir sun bonnets. <laughs> I think Jimbo's about done with pioneer times for the day. Did you have a good time? I had a spantastic time. <laughs> spantastic. Okay, so I'm going to call it a day. Why don't you tell them goodbye, babe? Goodbye, babe. <laughs>